What's going on, guys? It's Bryce again. Welcome to another episode of the Expedition to Try podcast, where I have no idea what I'm doing with my life, and I'm assuming a lot of you don't either. So we're going to try and figure it out together. Guess what? It's episode three of four <laughs> with the band, the Kings of Nothing. So episode three, coming at you with Zach Hudson, or as Brandon always calls him, Zach from home, which I actually don't know if you <laughs> know that joke or not. Do you know that joke? I do know that joke. <laughs> okay. Because, you make know, sure. <laughs> you're Bryce from school. Does he actually call me that? Yes. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> he doesn't think we know who you are. Um, How many other Bryces are out there that you guys know? Come on, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. But anyways, so the Kings of Nothing, uh, we've already posted uh, Brandon Porter, Dan the Man Grogan, Zach Hudson's coming at you third, and then the fourth episode will be the first full band episode. So I'm very excited to do that. Not sure how it's going to play out, <laughs> but we'll figure it out as it comes. But anyways, Zach, do you want to introduce yourself, say a little about who you are? All right. Well, yeah, I'm Zach Hudson. I'm the guitar player in the Kings of Nothing. I like to say I'm the uh, most talented in my instrument in the band. Just kidding. <laughs> but I have played the longest out of any of the other two guys. I started playing <laughs> guitar in like third grade. I was really terrible for the first like three, four years because your hands are tiny in elementary school, but you know, you get better all of a sudden, you know, one day it's like, wow, I can play songs that are cool. And then uh, a couple years after that, me and Brandon uh, decided sort of like late middle school, early high school to start a band and, you know, moving on from that, the rest is history. <laughs> so just to bring this up before we get into more specifics on you, uh, the past two episodes with Brandon and Dan I called them each the coolest member of the band, and uh -huh. they both, without fail, said, no, you're thinking of Zach. <laughs> so who do you think is the coolest member of the band? Do you think it's yourself, or do you think it's one of them? <laughs> well, I do have to say I am the only one who's been on an album cover, and I've done it twice. Oh, so. no. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I got to say, it's probably got to be Brandon, because, you know, front man. You know, he's got the vibes in that way. Always bringing in the ladies. Poor Dan. Poor Dan, <laughs> Sorry, that's man. true. Now, Dan's, Dan's the one who, he, he always got a lady too, you know? <laughs> so, you know, could be either way. <laughs> All right, perfect. So do you want to, before we get into more music, do you want to explain more like where you went to college, what you studied, what you're doing now in terms of work and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I went to the College of St. Rose. I bounced around a little bit at the uh, beginning of my uh, college career. I did a couple semesters at SUNY Oneonta, then at our local community college as well, kind of bounced around trying to figure out what it is. I mean, based on the theme of the show, what I wanted to do, I really <laughs> had no idea. Um, so I started out thinking I was going to be like a biology major, interested in like research and things like that. And it really didn't take very long until I realized that research kind of was not great. Um, so, and that wasn't really a particular interest for life. So um, after a, a semester at one of the uh, community colleges, I realized that I think I should probably go into, um, you know, back to a four-year school because nothing against the, the community colleges, but I was doing really well without trying very hard at all. Um, <laughs> which was nice, but at the same time, it was like, okay, I got to kind of figure something out. So, uh, I went into biology education, really not expecting it at the college of St. Uh, not knowing what to expect the college of St. Rose. And, um, when I started taking education classes, I realized that I actually liked it quite a bit. And then when I started doing more of the, you know, field placement stuff, I kind of realized that that could be something that I wanted to do. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years. I student taught at East Greenbush Central School District, and now I'm actually a teacher at the school where I student taught. So um, kind of led into a job, which was nice. <laughs> it's always funny to me because I don't – well, I first of all, I always forget that you studied biology because I did as well. Um, right. And I actually had a very similar experience because I went to community college for a semester before transferring to Binghamton, and I felt the same way. Like it was not easy. But it was like just barely a step up from high school, it seemed like. Yeah. And then you go to a, a 
a college like Binghamton or St. Rose and like the class just changed drastically, I feel like. Or maybe it's just the whole vibe in general, but it, it was a very different uh, experience. But with teaching, uh, do you find it weird being so young and teaching kids who are like, well, what year did you say you teach? I teach sixth and seventh grade. Okay, so they're much younger. It's not like you're teaching 17, 18 year olds in high school. Yeah. Or anything. So it's, it's, do you still find it a little weird that you're, what are you, 25, 24? Yep, 25. <laughs> do you think that's kind of weird, like how young you are teaching the younger generation? <laughs> Honestly, I found it more weird when I was student teaching because mm-hmm. I was like 22. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> whereas now, I get, think I should probably just kind of used to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but honestly, I think the kids find it weirder than I do because they always want to guess my age and they're like, you don't look 25 or 24, depending on like when of the year it was. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know what you want from me. Cause that's my <laughs> age. So like, but, uh, for the most part, I think they, they kind of like it as well. Cause it's like a connection thing, especially when they're younger. Cause they're like, Oh, he's not so old that it's like my dad or, you know, yeah. whoever. Are you going into school wearing your uh, khaki shorts and uh, band t-shirts? <laughs> I wish. Um, they actually make fun of me at work because I dress overly nice every day. Mm. And at my school, we don't have a dress code. So most of the guys, and I have a lot of guys in my hallway for whatever reason, uh, all kind of dress like bums. There was a guy who I knew from student teaching in a year where I subbed at the school. I didn't know he was actually a teacher. I thought he was like a hall monitor or something. He, <laughs> He doesn't wear shoes. He's got ripped jeans and like a hoodie on every day. He teaches health. What do you know? <laughs> Dude, you really should. You should wear the band t-shirts. They'll think you're so cool. <laughs> God, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so let's get right into the music. We're going all the way back as far as we can go to oh boy. what is your first memory of music of any sort? First memory of music. Um so my dad was always really big into into music. So we got like uh, a pretty big record and CD collection at my house. Um, so the first uh, record I actually really liked and my dad made a cassette for me was a uh, Kiss Greatest Hits album. Oh, and I still yeah. have it on cassette. So it's like, a, <laughs> you know, just the greatest hits of a bunch of the hits Kiss stuff from 70s and 80s. <laughs> my dad used to play kiss a lot in acdc uh probably not the best band for <laughs> young children but i remember one time i asked like are all their songs about like drugs and hell and he's like listen if you think about it like that i'm not gonna allow you to listen to acdc but like that's what their songs are about what do you mean what <laughs> how do you expect me to think about it any other way <laughs> anyway kiss was another one that i grew up with <laughs> Um, so what were your experiences with music going through school? Did you have to take music classes or was it solely just your own lessons with guitar and stuff like that? So I definitely had to take like general music classes in elementary and middle school. Um, and it was sort of like what I would imagine the classic like image of what that would be. Like you sang like classical songs and like i think it was in like second or third grade they make you start to learn how to play the recorder Mm -hmm. um which like nobody can actually be good at for like whatever (laughs) reason like you've never met a good recorder player um and then same thing in middle school we started to do a little bit more um like intricate things like they did have like a class where we learned to play the keyboard and stuff Mm -hmm. um but it was also like a computerized system. So you could like scam the system and not actually be good at the keyboard and get a hundred on it. That was me. Um, and honestly, in terms of actual music class in school, I did, was not a big fan because it was more, you know, of that older classical, like what am I singing about? Like, you know, the Appalachian trail for when it's yeah. like, there's a way cooler stuff and I know it exists. So I also didn't particularly like my elementary school music teacher. So I think that put me on a, a step backwards. Uh, how old were you when you started your guitar lessons? Did you say? I was in third grade. So I guess third you're what, grade. like eight or nine, something like that. Okay. So 
I'm just thinking about, uh, did you watch Ned's Declassified? I did. I wasn't the biggest fan, but I definitely watched it. So there was an episode where he wanted to learn guitar, but he kept getting frustrated because the teacher was teaching him scales and stuff. And he just like kept having the flashbacks to like, I want to rock and roll. And he's like playing electric guitar. Were you in a similar mindset or were you down to like take it step by step and just learn as much as you can, like over the course of a couple of years? Like, how did you feel about learning guitar? I definitely wanted to rock and roll because uh, <laughs> I know like I still like the first book that I had to to learn from and it was with with the teacher um, was just, you know, like a level one it had like, you know, the picture of the guitar on the front. It was sort of like the classical book that you would probably get at a school. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know like a couple of songs in there were things like some early Elvis stuff. I'm pretty sure like Hound Dog was in there. And it's like, that's kind of cool. But then there was like a bunch of other ones that were like, I'm I'm not really interested in this. Because also at the same time, I said Kiss was one of my favorite bands, or, you know, early influence bands, but also the band The Ramones was. Mm. Those were kind of the two first bands that I heard. Um, Kind of along what you said, another band of like, it's hard to not sing like now I want to sniff some glue and not know what it's about. Um, (laughs) So there was a bunch of songs like that that I kind of wanted to learn, whereas my teacher was much more, you know, of that like, oh, well, we got to learn the chord shapes and then the scales and this and that. How did your music taste change from like Kiss, the Ramones, and that kind of more classics genre into where you're at now what was that pathway (laughs) honestly i think it was a pretty easy transition because the ramones are sort of straight up punk yeah in terms of like there's you know style and whatnot whereas kiss is more just like classic rock and one of the things i liked about the ramones was the was the songwriting i liked their songs better but their stuff was recorded a little bit more raw than kiss So there was a record that came out in the 90s from Kiss called Psycho Circus that has these really big, like, guitar sounds. Mm -hmm. And the really burst into punk rock or the initial start into that was when I heard a bunch of uh, American Idiot Green Day stuff on the radio because it sort of married the two styles together. It sort of had the punk rock root of, like, the songwriting style, but it also had um, the really big guitar sounds of, like, the 90s Kiss records which was, like, mind-blowing to me. I was like, oh, they put them together. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were listening to all that, <laughs> I'm sure that didn't help you uh, with the early stages of learning guitar because it probably just made you want to, like, skip forward so much more and be able to play so much more complex stuff. <laughs> How did you get through that and, like, Did it just inspire you to like take your time or did you want to just jump for it? (laughs) I wanted to just jump for it. And I think (laughs) it probably took maybe like a year or a year and a half or something of guitar lessons for me to wear my uh, guitar teacher down enough to be like, (laughs) come on, man, we got to learn this stuff. And then we started doing like power chord types of things. And that kind of led into all the stuff that I, I like now. (laughs) <laughs> uh so what was your i think brandon told this story on this podcast but what was your first concert ever first concert ever was uh drake bell crossgates <laughs> mall that's not what he told me dude what do you say <laughs> what do you say my first one was now i'm now i'm gonna have to look back i might be wrong so listeners don't yell at me but i think he said Maybe it was your first concert together that I'm thinking of, which ah. was Train and Maroon 5. Yes, our first concert together was Train and Maroon okay. 5. So your first concert by yourself was Drake Bell. Honestly, not awful. <laughs> I got to meet him afterwards, too. He signed a CD. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> In light of I, I told- developments. Yeah, <laughs> not, not, not great anymore. Back then, that was pretty cool. Totally but, awesome. <laughs> um, I told this story. I, my first concert was the Jonas Brothers nice. uh, at Darien Lake, and I was very embarrassed to <laughs> go to that concert. I was going with my sister, my mom, and my sister's friend, and I was young, 
So I was yeah. at that age where I'm like, I don't want anyone to see me here. <laughs> uh, in that note, I know when I was in like fifth or sixth grade, I tried really hard to go to the uh, Miley Cyrus Hannah Montana concert. Mm. Um, <laughs> couldn't get tickets, sold out like crazy. Um, you know, still regret that one. <laughs> I, I remember also going to the Hannah Montana movie when that came out, whenever that was. And I really wanted to see it, but I couldn't let anyone know that I really wanted to see it. So I was like super embarrassed sitting in the movie theater and I was like <laughs> crouched down in my seat and stuff. I'm like, God, I hope no one sees me here. But it was a good movie and I dig it. <laughs> it was a good movie. No shame. <laughs> no shame. I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you, you've kind of touched on it, but how did you fall into the specific genre of music that Tcon plays the more as Brandon said you guys call it punk rock not punk rock <laughs> <laughs> um well I have a sister who's a couple years older than me and she was into a lot of the early kind of mid-2000s pop punk bands mm -hmm. so the first time I ever like I heard Green Day and stuff like that on the radio so I kind of found that on my own but she introduced me to a lot of the more kind of pop punk bands. So like the uh, Blink-182s, the All Time Lows. Um, there's a band called The Academy Is that is uh, pretty good as well. Boys Like Girls, all that kind of genre of stuff. She kind of introduced me to more so than me finding it on my own. And then, you know, I think kind of marrying that with more of the classic rock stuff that led to some of you know, more of my musical taste. Cause I was like, Oh, you have like, you know, this pop influence, but it's also rock. And it came together in sort of not like a, not like a matchbox 20, which is a little more like poppy, but more like a, had a little edge to it, which I kind of liked. Cause you know, especially like a, a middle school kid, a little angsty looking for <laughs> something with some, some grit to it. So <laughs> a lot of those bands also had at least one hit at the time. So mm -hmm. like back then radio was still kind of cool to a degree. Um, so you would hear that stuff around, which I, you know, also made me think that that stuff was cool. <laughs> I was going to say, do you think uh, your music taste back in middle school and high school was quote unquote cooler than everyone else around you? Cause to me, it seemed like, and I was a part of this group, but everyone listened to like the top 40 and like just the pop stuff that was on the radio. Did, <laughs> were you still into that, that stuff or did you think you were way too advanced for that kind of music? <laughs> I don't know if advanced is the right word, but it really did <laughs> interest me. Yeah. Um, and then I would bring like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like the Foley Ado Fallout Boy record and be like, come on, you gotta listen to this. It's amazing. And everybody be like, no, it's, it's like, it's fine. But they're like, you know, not going to be like super into it. Yeah. So what do you, what do you find interesting about more the punk and pop rock, not pop rock, punk, <laughs> punk rock and pop punk songs and albums and stuff compared to just plain old pop and the top 40 stuff? I think for the most part, there's more uh, personal lyrics and things along that line. So it's more, it's more real in a lot of senses. So like you might get a song by like a pop person that sings about like, you know, like dancing and having like a good time or like we cover the song. So I'm not going to say shame and it's not a bad song. Let's dance by Lady Gaga. It's like, that's a good song, and I'm not going to say it's not, but it doesn't have any real personal meaning to me at all, because it's like, okay, let's dance. It'll be okay. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, let's dance. Like, that's good, <laughs> like, especially if you're a good singer, but, like, it yeah. doesn't have any real meaning, whereas something like, um, you know, singing about whether it be, like, a breakup or, you know, just, you know, hearing a song and that song being, like, totally, like, mind-blowing – or especially early on, I was sort of into, um, you know, like American Idiot was one of the big records for me. And at that time, we were still sort of in the, you know, that was 2004, 2005. Um, there were still like in the aftermath, the initial aftermath of like the 9-11 stuff. So it was like, even though like you hear a song like Wake Me Up When September Ends or like, 
um, you know, Jesus of Suburbia. There was like all this stuff on that record relating to things that were actually going on in the world, like people's parents were going to war or like, you know, just seeing like the image of the planes hitting the towers and stuff like that. It was more, you know, deeper and it had like kind of a, a connection for me. So what song, if you could go back in time and listen to any song for the first time again, what song would that be? Oh boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I would probably say, um, I would probably say Homecoming on the American Idiot record. Um, it's still like, it's, it's sort of an underrated song on that, but it brings a culmination of the rest of the album sort of together. And it brings you through these different stages of the song because it's like nine minutes and there's all these little parts. And, um, I don't remember the name of the section of the part, but it's, it's right after a section where Trey cool sings. And every time I still listen to it, even now, uh, after hearing the song like a gazillion times, uh, it still gives me chills of like how like unreally good it is. So, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to listen to that. I I do like Green Day. It's just I haven't listened to them that much for some reason. And you would think Brandon would like force feed it to me because it's his favorite <laughs> band, but he never really has, and I'm kind of surprised by that. <laughs> I think it's more like you. I listened to it so much when I was young mm -hmm. that like I just know it, and I yeah. don't like actively seek it out all the time. Because if I yeah. did, it'd be just like, even though they have a lot of records, there's only so many Green Day <laughs> records. You, you know, you can listen to that much. So how do you uh, go about listening to newer music? Like, do you tend to stick with the bands and artists that you like and listen to? Or do you go off on different directions and just fall down the rabbit hole and find new artists? How do you go about doing that? I would say I tend to, it's not necessarily the band that I stick to or like the, mm -hmm. the bands that I like. Cause I definitely do like if somebody that I like puts out a new album, I'm definitely going to be looking for it, but it's more, I stick along the certain uh, genres that I like. And I don't really yeah. stray a lot from that. Like, so I like kind of the straight up punk rock, like the older stuff also some of the hardcore stuff in the eighties and then, you know, more of the pop punk bands from like the mid to late nineties to the early two thousands. And like outside of that, I don't expand too much. <laughs> uh, so who would you say are some of your current inspirations and like, who do you as a guitar player aspire to be like, if anybody. So I think <laughs> My answer for this is sort of funny because our band is nothing like the people <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, so I'm actually a pretty big Rolling Stones fan mm -hmm. and Keith Richards is unbelievably good. And, you know, you go back and listen to anything Rolling Stones. It's like the guitar fills or the guitar solos in this section of this, you know, song. Uh, like if you listen to the solo on Wild Horses, it's unbelievably good. Um, they also have a song called don't stop that I, uh, really like. There's like a guitar solo in there. It's really not that complicated, but it's like one of my favorite guitar solos of all time long, uh, come to find out Keith Richards doesn't actually play that part. It's the other <laughs> guitar player in the band, but, um, it's still really good. Um, so I'd say probably Keith Richards, but then also another one of my favorite guitar players is El Jefe of no effects. Um, mm -hmm. And he sort of blends in some elements of like metal and some different things that I don't really listen to a lot, but when it kind of gets infused to the genre that I like, I'm like, oh, well, that blends really in a cool way and it sounds different from everything else. All right. So <laughs> this is a two-part question. Um, so part one, do you ever make mistakes in playing guitar? All the time. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> How do you deal with those mistakes, both like mentally, do you beat yourself up or like, are you kind of laid back? And then how do you go from making that mistake and figuring out how to correct it in the future? Um, so I think that's one of the things, especially early on, 
that is hard to get over. It's like you're playing something, you play the wrong note, you like stop and you think about it. And you're like, well, I got to restart because I screwed it up and, you know, I need to do it again. Whereas now, I think it's probably mostly a confidence thing. I know how to move my fingers and where my fingers are supposed to go. It's, you know, just a muscle memory thing. So I'm pretty good at just adjusting and, you know, adjusting to whatever the mistake was to make sure that I can compensate for it. Um, you know, and it's one of those things, especially if you're playing live, you can't worry about it because if yeah. you stop and do something else, <laughs> everybody's going to know you screwed up. Whereas especially for us being a band that nobody really knows, you know, they don't know how the song goes. Maybe that off note's <laughs> right. They have no idea. Or you're not listening close enough necessarily to, to even notice. So, <laughs> Do you feel like there's a benefit to having fewer fans as you're like starting to learn your craft or do you think it's more beneficial to have a lot of fans? I mean, I think it's probably beneficial in a way because we've definitely improved songwriting wise. So from our first record with, with Dan, um, cause there's sort of two beginnings to our band as I'm sure you've uh, heard about before. Um, but our first <laughs> record with Dan, there's like maybe, I don't know, two or three songs on that record that I would say are pretty good. And other ones that are like, there's definitely things that if we wrote them now, those songs would change, whether it be like a really long instrument part, or it's like, you know, why did we write four verses and four choruses for this one song? Like, it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> um, but it's just like, we didn't know what we were doing. And then as we've progressed, especially playing together, um, I think that we've gotten much better at like, Tripping, trimming down the songs and making it like the bulk of what it needs to be. So making something that used to be like four and a half minutes, maybe three minutes, but just kind of trimming the fat and getting it down to like the best parts of the song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Brandon told me the story about uh, <laughs> Stick Fingers with Guns. <laughs> and I had, I'd never heard the story about the, the <laughs> you playing the drums on Rock Band. And just holding the laptop up to the TV. That was so funny. Uh, I even, never heard it's, that. It's <laughs> even worse than that. Because we set it up. Like we would literally have like a stand in front of the the like outgoing vol- speakers of the TV. And just like <laughs> set it up like it was legitimate. And we thought it was so like. We're like oh this is genius. Like we don't have a drummer. Brandon's pretty good at rock band drums. And we set it up. We even tried it with multiple sets of rock band drums. Like there was the Green Day kit. There was the Beatles kit. There was like all these different famous bands kits that you could try. And it's like, oh, well, which one sounds the best? Like, does it matter? We're micing up a TV. Um, Are there any like uh, small things like that? Like that you look back on and you're like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe we did that. Well, one of the things that blows my mind is if you listen to the first song on that first album, which is a loose first album, I don't know why me and Brandon did not think it was a good idea to tune, but the song is ridiculously (laughs) out of tune. Like, if you turn it on, you're literally like, what the fuck is that? That is the most (laughs) disgusting sounding thing you've ever heard. He did say that too. I was like, that can't be real. There's no way. (laughs) But now that I've heard it twice, I believe it. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not even like it's close. Like it's way out of tune. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Oh God, I'm going to, I'm going to request. I listen to at least one song off that album. When I visit Brandon, (laughs) I'll make him play it. (laughs) He'll probably leave and I'll just listen to it. And hopefully not go deaf. <laughs> I'm going to be serious. On that, there's actually a couple of songs that I actually think are okay. All right. What are those ones called? I'll listen to those. <laughs> um, there's one called Barely Wheezing that I like. Um, there's another one. Uh, I think it's called Loser uh, or something like that. And actually, there was somebody who liked one of our songs. If you look on uh, SoundCloud, I'm pretty sure it's the loser song that has like 800 listens to on SoundCloud and like somebody really liked it and kept listening to it. Wow. And other ones 
don't sound quite as bad as as other ones. And but in terms of songwriting, there's a few songs on there that are actually uh, not that bad. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll have to look into that then. <laughs> so, what are some of your personal short term goals for your music? Ooh, short term goals. Um, I think the most immediate thing now, being that we just put our album out, it's been out for like about a week. Mm-hmm. is definitely playing uh some shows um and i think what would be beneficial for us is getting the uh some opener shows or with you know uh other bands that are maybe a little bit more known or at least could introduce us to like those people's friends and things like that in the local area um because there are definitely places to play in albany but uh it's sometimes hard like it's hard to book your own show when you know you can bring like, you know, 10, 12 people at the max. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, it's hard to get other people to be like, oh, there's this unknown band that nobody's going to go see. We'll get on that <laughs> show. So it's like trying to get like a group of people that you can play with and kind of expand from there, I think would be a good short term goal for us. Hmm. Uh, so I'm curious, what do you think there's a point in time that if you reached a certain like level of awareness from fans and stuff that you could see you and the band doing it more full time or like going on tour. Um, or do you think it's kind of, do you prefer it as like this side, a uh, gig that you just really enjoy doing in your free time? If it was any point in college, Prior to student teaching, I probably would have said, like, hell yeah, let's get out of here and go, you know, go for it. But even even now, if it reached, like, a certain level of success, like, even enough to play with, like, like, if I had the opportunity to play with, like, a band that even just plays, like, club shows, but, like, sells, you know, pretty well at club shows... I mean, at 25, I could always get back into teaching. I think it'd be kind of nuts not to, personally. Um, Just because, you know, how many opportunities are you going to have to go actually make a living or potentially make some money uh, doing that? And, you know, you're not going to make that switch at, like, 35. So (laughs) if we're going to do it, now's the time. Do you see it being – because Brandon always said, like, oh – me and Zach are both teachers. Depending on what Dan ends up doing, we'll have summers off. Would you ever just like teach there in a year and then just take all summer off and just tour around the country if you had the opportunity? I absolutely would. That would be like <laughs> I I kind of actually planned on doing some stuff like that in general. Um, mm-hmm. Because like for instance, this summer I was taking grad classes and stuff still, so I couldn't. Uh, necessarily go out and do all the things that i want or like would have liked to do over the summer yeah whereas next year i know i'm gonna be uh you know open yeah. so that basically leaves a couple of options well i could get a summer job or i could you know do some fun stuff while i can and don't really have any family obligations <laughs> and i'm kind of leaning towards that right now so in <laughs> in the same vein of that it's like if we had the opportunity to like tour or something in the summer absolutely Awesome. Yeah, I would come to Rochester. Me and Andy will go. You'll have at least two fans in the audience. Heck yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So what kind of advice would you give to younger you, either specifically with music uh, or just your life in general? Well, with music, I would say in terms of playing the guitar, there's two things. I would one say... It's important to tune your instrument. <laughs> Not a joke. It's it's legitimate advice. I know there's other bands that I like that never tuned their instruments, and they all tune now. So, you know, not <laughs> co- more common mistake than you'd think. Um, also, um, I was sort of resistant, like I said, early on learning to play guitar to uh, learn some of the, the basic mechanics of guitar playing so for instance i was pretty resistant initially on like 
your pinky is always your weak, uh, your weak finger. Um, and I would, you know, my guitar teacher, like I always found ways to compensate for not using my pinky. And my guitar teacher would be like, you really got to learn to use your pinky because you're going to need it. Um, which I've gotten much better at. And I actually use my pinky now way more than I use my third finger, which is actually like a stronger finger, but now I use it more as like a, you know, where you need like a bass. So that is definitely one of the things I would say, because now that I actually use my pinky, I use it all the time and it's made me able to do like faster things in terms of like soloing and things, uh, things along those lines and scales and stuff like that. And it's one of the jokes we also have in the band is Brandon doesn't use his pinky when he plays guitar either. <laughs> he like curls it up in this like w weird way. Like he's going to get arthritis <laughs> from just like curling it around and he won't use it. Um, <laughs> In terms of life, though, I guess, I would probably say just don't be afraid to jump into new to new stuff. Because um, I'm somebody who, in terms of starting something new, I'm, I'm usually get like pretty nervous or pretty anxious. But I've kind of gotten to a point now where I just kind of say fuck it and like realize jumping in too, uh, you know, head first is really not that bad um whereas it used to be nervous about like i remember we played our first show as a band and i was like pretty nervous playing in front of people and it wasn't even like something i could control but it was almost like your body's like in shock like i feel like my yeah. knees like tightening up I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit there's people here um whereas like you know in reality i shouldn't have been nervous at all um but like you know, I should be more nervous, like teaching children now, especially my first <laughs> year after this year. And I just had to go in and I'm like, well, fuck it. Whatever happens, happens. And, you know, I think I've gotten better at that. And I wish I, my younger self was better at that. <laughs> I think that's a tough thing for pretty much any kid. I don't If a kid was that confident and never got nervous, I feel like I'd be a little afraid. Like, who's this kid going to become? This could be scary. Because... Like yeah. it's, it's hard to go into shit when you haven't really experienced, like you haven't figured out that a lot of stuff just turns out okay. And there was no reason to be nervous. So like as an adult, well, adult quote unquote, uh, yeah, I've learned more like someone said that the, the feelings you get when you're nervous are exactly the same as the feelings when you get excited. If you feel nervous, if you can somehow say to yourself, like, oh, I'm really excited, like it tricks your brain into being excited and you're like more confident and you feel like you can do whatever it is you're about to do. It takes time. You like, you have to learn how to actually do that. And the only way to kind of do that is to experience <laughs> nervousness and realize that it ends up being okay in the end. At least that's yeah. my own personal experience with it. No, I totally agree. But I think I had, I had pretty, pretty, I feel like I had a lot of like physical reactions to being mm. really nervous, which is weird um, because a lot of people get nervous, but they don't necessarily physically react to it. So like uh, I was a pretty good baseball player and uh, I would get so nervous around our varsity coach. I'm not even joking. And this wasn't even like in games or things like games were fine in, yeah. in like workouts. We'd do these off season workouts. I would vomit. Around. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> like, and I'm not even talking like I would, I would literally leave and I'd vomit in like rounds of three, like multiple times and be like, we got to go check on Zach because like he's having like a visceral re I'd be trying to work out with the thing. He'd be nearby and I'd be like, working extra hard and just psh, done <laughs> was it was he just like a big dude and like screamed a lot or like why why were you so nervous around him <laughs> he was sort he wasn't like a big guy but he was kind of intimidating in terms of like mm. the way he ran the program it was sort of like <laughs> militaristic and like you towed the line it was like i always wanted to try to do good and like there was this freaking machine they called it the vertimax you'd wear like a, a harness around your waist and you'd get attached to like resistance bands and you would jump 
And Jesus. like, I don't know if it was like my stomach going up and down or what it is, but whenever <laughs> I went on the Vertimax, it was over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I do. I did not have to do that in baseball. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I never went on the Vertimax. <laughs> oh, I, you're lucky. I was not good at baseball. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what kind of advice would you give to someone who's just getting started in music or maybe afraid to get started in music for whatever reason? Um, in terms of, of somebody getting into music, it's, it's, I think the advice that I would give them is sort of the advice I would give myself. You got to jump in with, with full feet and, uh, with both feet and you really shouldn't you know, you're not going to be good at first. There's going to be a lot of screw ups and there's going to be a lot of countless hours of you, you know, in your room sounding horrible. And it's not going to necessarily be the most fun thing at first. But if you keep chipping away at it, all of a sudden, like uh, with myself in particular, and I've heard other stories of guitar players talking about this, it wasn't like you're naturally gifted right off the bat. You know, some people are more so than others. But like all of a sudden, one day I remember in like, sixth or seventh grade there was no real change in anything that i had done but all of a sudden it was just like oh i can play this now and it just happened it wasn't like i did anything different i just kept you know kept going so you really have to be persistent um with learning whatever it is that you're trying to do whether it be guitar piano singing whatever um and in terms of somebody starting like like a band or getting into music with like a, a group or something like that. It's, you got to find people that you like to play with because if you're not having fun, then it's just, it's not worth it. Um, and some of the the best, you know, jam sessions, I think like uh, T-Con has had have been things that nobody heard where it's like, we have some like mini demos on our phone of like the first time we played like spit or um, you know, some of the songs on this album. And it's like, wow, we actually played that really good. And even though it's recorded in like a crude way, it sounds really good. Yeah. You know, and it's fun, <laughs> even though it was just us. Do you have a favorite memory from a house party or a live show? Okay. So <laughs> I think our best show was probably our album release show that was in the basement of your house Hell yeah. in Binghamton. I had a concussion, um, I think. <laughs> I, I I think it's the show where everybody wrote on you as well. Um, they like signed the oh, name or something. I did not have a concussion that party. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but yes, now I, I different party. I remember this one. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that's. Good. I'll have to post um, that picture just with me with a bunch of sharpies. All over my body. <laughs> it started as me just keeping track of how many people were there. Because I, I really thought like the party was going to blow up. So I was yeah. like, I got to tally everybody. But then people just started writing whack messages. But, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Your story. <laughs> um, I do remember that though. Like it started off with like a couple of, you had like some tally marks on your forearm or something. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it was just like, oh, Bryce has got not only all over his body, but now his like neck and face got it. Um, <laughs> Why has Bryce got a dick on his forehead? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think during that show, there's one thing I like kind of remember because your basement was kind of dark and we had this little like jut in to play in and it was like sort of like a stage, but then we, we packed in everybody else down there. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I remember is we played the song Spit and during that song, um, there was like, not just like, uh, uh, there was like a legit mosh pit and like people were really, really into the song. And that's like just a distinct memory of like playing a song. And for the first, I don't even want to say for the first time, but for like one of the first times at like a show where there's a lot of people or more people in like the space at least. So it seemed really full that it was like, oh, people actually really like this song and they're like, you know, really rocking out to it, which I thought was pretty cool. Spit's my favorite song. <laughs> all right <laughs> i actually i think uh both brandon and dan has have said this but the concert i went to the first live one i ever saw you in was i can't remember where it was it was in albany at some bar there's like the bars in the uh, front and then back and they both are like that was our worst show we've ever done 
<laughs> oh, without a doubt. The worst show we ever played. We all agree. Because, um, like, the sound guy was, like, rushing you, and he was, like, muting some of your uh, guitar and stuff like that, and <laughs> I didn't even realize it. <laughs> yeah, um, nobody was happy after that show. We got, because, I mean, you were there. There was, like, a pretty decent turnout yeah. in terms of people coming. And we all felt like we played like garbage, partially <laughs> because we couldn't hear anything. The sound guy was horrible. He yeah. told us to start and Dan's drums weren't even set up. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we had not that like I, I've heard a band say this before, and I think it's true. I don't know if people can tell the difference from when we play really good versus when we play really bad. Like I genuinely don't think people can tell a difference. But we know the difference. And yeah. our bass player at the time didn't practice <laughs> with us all the time. And, you know, I guess it was so bad that the sound guy, like, turned them <laughs> off, basically. Um, <laughs> so it was like, we knew it was bad. We couldn't hear anything. And we just kind of went with it. But it was like, <laughs> afterwards, nobody was in a good mood. Because we felt like we just had, like, a bunch of friends and stuff there at the show. And it was a pretty good turnout. And we just blew it like completely. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's great. <laughs> um, so do you want to more as a wrap up, like say a little about the new album, what's it called? And like the basics, cause we're going to fully dive into the album specifically when we have the full band on, but anything you want to say about it now would be great. Yeah. So uh new album's called the getting there. Um, and in terms of, of the writing process with it, it was definitely the most inclusive in terms of everybody had their fingerprints like all over different songs. Because previously we had Brandon as like the main lyricist um, and kind of structure of the song person. Or like before what would usually happen is I would come up with like a guitar part or something and I'd say like, oh, we have this, it's really cool. I would give it to Brandon. He'd have the guitar part. Now he'd write like a structure to it. And then we'd have like lyrics and then the guitar part. And then we'd bring it to Dan and we'd make it a full song. And he kind of refined it from there. Whereas this, we did a lot of different things. So there were some that were like that, but then there's other ones. Cause Brandon was in Binghamton and me and Dan were both in Albany. Um, we, we had some sessions that we called um, Zach and Dan's magical adventure where it was just me and Dan <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we wrote a bunch of the songs for the album, like me and him together. And it was just us more so going through musical stuff. Um, and then a couple of the songs from the album came, came from that. And we came up, I think with a lot more dynamic parts. Cause we were kind of, we took our time longer and we wrote the music and things together. It wasn't like, Oh, Dan wrote his part. I wrote my part. Brandon did his thing. We all mm -hmm. kind of you know, worked on it as, as a group. And I think that's one of the things that actually makes a band like almost better or more creative in a lot of ways than a solo artist who has kind of like total control. It was like, Oh, we all bounced off and played off of each other with, uh, you know, the songs. And I think especially for this album that that was really key and kind of a big change from what we've done previously. Is there anything you've learned from making this album that, you'll know to do differently when the next music, whatever the next single or album comes out that something you'll change for that. I think probably in terms of the writing, I think it'd be great for us to do it all together in the room at once. Mm -hmm. Cause like this time we did stuff where it was like, there was a few songs that we did all together. Um, of course, but not everyone. So like some of the things that me and Dan did, we turned into songs and it was, I don't want to say without Brandon, because we of course, you know, finished them and practiced them with Brandon, but it wasn't all three of us at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, or like another song on the album is like one that I wrote that I brought to practice. And, you know, the way I wrote it by myself is, you know, pretty much what's on, on the album. So it's kind of just being a little bit more inclusive with all of us together, doing it all at once um all together because this is the first time since we were in high school that we actually had the ability to do that um i think that answers the question yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find you and tcon on social media where can they find the album all that jazz 
uh, you're not going to find me pretty much anywhere. Um, cause I, uh, I was, I'm late to the social media game in terms of myself. Uh, I, I have an Instagram. Don't follow me. Um, uh, I'm going to post uh, it in the description anyways. <laughs> uh, I think it's Z Hudson 37. So there you go. Um, but we can uh, all see the, what concerts you've been to though. That's so much that's fun. That's true. That is, I got to have the new post cause we went to a concert last week. Oh, hell um, yeah. Um, but uh, the TCON stuff, we have a Facebook account, we have a Twitter account, which if you really want to laugh, check out the Twitter account. We got some good <laughs> shit on there. Um, we also have a Bandcamp page where you can get our music as well as uh, Spotify. Um, our stuff's on iTunes and most of the other main, uh, you know, streaming platforms as well. And pretty soon we are going to be. Uh, having a we're working on it now a uh, youtube page where we're going to have all our music and we might upload some live stuff and we were talking preliminary discussions of doing a uh, live stream of some of the the new stuff so we'll see Hell yeah. that'd be sick <laughs> you gotta yeah. have your manager there you know i gotta be there for all that i gotta i gotta be the one stopping dan symbols from clashing too loud like i always My used favorite- to my favorite pictures of us playing live are the ones where it's us and then you're in the background right behind Dan with your arms crossed like <laughs> in the backyard at 265. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Any last remarks or anything you want to say to the listeners? I'm just going to leave it with rock on kids and have a fantastic <laughs> afternoon. All right. How oh, I yeah. end my classes. That's how we'll end the podcast. <laughs> All right. Perfect. So thank you everyone for listening. We really appreciate it. Zach, thanks for coming on. Can't wait to have the full band on next. Get ready, everybody. <laughs> Until then, <laughs> peace out and good luck.